Imagine this, it is early 2021, Eastern Europe is about to witness a new war. Hungary and Romania had their share of conflicts in the past. Transylvania, a region that is today Romanian, was part of the Hungarian Kingdom for quite a long time. They also fought on the opposing sides in World War I, and even today there is still some animosity left. Imagine the political situation deteriorating rapidly. Imagine the EU or NATO don't matter, and that the two countries suddenly announce war on each other. How would such a war unravel? Watch to find out. Hostilities start immediately. The morale is assumed to be the same, and no third-party government interferes. Both the active army and the reserves would be mobilized as soon as possible. Romania has access to the Black Sea and the navy to defend its shores. Hungary is landlocked. That means Romania is spending some of its defense budget on a navy, which is a fair size for the budget, but largely inconsequential to this conflict. As the navy personnel too have some combat training, Romania would look for the naval personnel whose naval systems experience isn't crucial and start converting them to some sort of an army unit. Even though such units might not need months of training as regular civilians would need, any such unit would enter combat at a later date. By then, the war in the air would be in full swing. Romanian Air Force is a mix of old MiG-21s, modernized by Israel, and second-hand F-16s, stuck roughly at 1990s tech level. Opposing them are Hungarian-operated Gripens, their tech level being roughly a decade or two old. Exact numbers of MiG-21s are not available. A year ago roughly two dozen were in service, but they are being retired as Romania is procuring more and more F-16s. Currently there may be a dozen and a half Lancers active, with perhaps a dozen of those being the fighter variant with a decent radar. Those are still semi-decent platforms for point defense. They use Israeli sourced targeting helmets and not so obsolete missiles. But those planes are still too vulnerable to be used on their own in offensive actions. Their limited range would also be a big issue. To be used over the entire Hungary, they would have to be based fairly close to the border. The two countries aren't huge, but there's still considerable distance involved, and planes might start flying right away from their home bases, before some units are relocated. Hungarian Gripens would initially start from a fairly central location. Romanian fighters are based in two separate bases, but it's likely the Hungarians who would have to scatter their planes around. Romanians have more planes, and attacking an airbase is something even fairly low-tech planes can attempt to do. Romania could count on a dozen F-16s effectively, with perhaps a few more in the medium term, as well as on a dozen Lancers, with half a dozen more used as decoys or strike planes. If an opportunity presents itself, Romania could even try to use trainer jets, either as decoys or for bombing some unprotected targets. Hungarian Gripens are slightly more capable in air-to-air -air combat even than the Romanian F-16s. Their local networking capability, linking several Gripens together, could come in very handy. If they are defending, Gripens would also be able to be fairly quiet, with their own radars off, as the ground radars would be doing most of the work. If Romania went on an air offensive deep inside Hungary, it is thus likely the initial air battles would result in a few Romanian planes lost for every Hungarian one. But if Hungary tried to send their planes on strike missions deep into Romania, they would have to cross a lot of hostile territory due to Romania being larger, and would be subject to the same issue of silent interceptions by Romanian fighters vectored by the ground control. In a close battle, Lancer Seas could be still quite lethal, so it's not impossible Hungary would lose just as many planes as Romania in such a scenario. Especially considering Romania actually has a decent surface-to-air missile defense, unlike Hungary. The Patriot battery shown has been delivered in late 2020, so its crew likely needs more time to get up to full effectiveness. Hungary, on the other hand, has a token SAM force. Though against those jet trainers or even MiGs, those still might be effective. Given the risks, though, it's likely neither side would really go deep, but would be content to operate near the front line and try to ambush the other side's fighters. Romania is in a better position there with its more plentiful aircraft. 
they could perform airstrikes on Hungarian tactical positions and thus pretty much force the Hungarians to perform interceptions. Hungary would, on the other hand, be hard-pressed to find enough planes to do both combat air patrol and air support at the same time. Romanian Air Force is better prepared for air-to-ground missions and has procured more targeting equipment and guided weapons. War in the air would, of course, be just a backdrop for the larger conflict being fought below. Romania and Hungary share a border roughly 300 kilometers long, and the border area is pretty suitable for large vehicle formations. Eastern half of Hungary is pretty much flat farmland, as is the few dozen kilometer wide area in Romania from the border to Bihor Mountains. Going further into Romania would be quite hard due to the Carpathian mountain ranges. But who would really go into whose territory? Hungarian army would initially be positioned in these bases here. Romanian army units would start from these bases. Most of those areas house a brigade worth of combat units, which clearly shows Romania has many more units. Hungarian ground army is usually credited with some 10 to 11,000 personnel, but its whole military also has over 11,000 joint command personnel, as it organizes its armed forces differently than the Romanians. Most of those joint command personnel are there to support the ground army. Romania has a ground army force of some 36,000 and a more specialized joint command force of 16,000. Given that they support both navy and air force, a smaller percentage of those would really be supporting the Romanian army. When joint command units and those Romanian retrained navy units are added, Romania would still have more than twice the troops and would likely put them to good use opening as wide a front as possible. There aren't any real obstacles on the border, no big rivers or even chains of urban centers, just huge flat swaths of farmland. Some smaller rivers are of course always present, but initially the brigades closest to the borders would be able to push forward unimpeded. In addition to those units close by, it's the rapid reaction special forces deployed by air assets that would also be used. Hungary has a regiment worth of forces trained for such incursions. Romania has a whole brigade, roughly three times more troops. But also Romania has more aircraft with which to actually deploy those troops. Assuming two-thirds of each side's fleet is used, Romania might deploy some 600 lightly equipped troops in one go, while Hungary would likely be limited to under 250. These figures do not include troops delivered by transport planes. Hungary has no such planes of its own, while Romania has quite a fleet and a battalion worth of paradrop trained troops. With two-thirds of the planes, the whole 400 troop strong battalion could be deployed. Interestingly, there are three C-17 heavy transport planes permanently stationed in Hungary, but those are shared planes operated by multinational crews. Even if somehow commandeered by Hungary, their strategic transport design wouldn't lead to immediate usefulness in this conflict. Hungary would also have more trouble actually trying to deploy any force behind the initial frontline, due to Romanian air defenses. In addition to more planes and more SAMs, Romania also operates mobile radar-controlled anti-aircraft artillery, which could prove fatal to helicopters if they happen to fly close to it. Shoulder-launched missiles are also a big threat to helicopters, and that's an area where Hungary's more modern Mistral missiles are ahead of Romanian's Strela variants. Attack helicopters would also be threatened by such missiles. Hungary has proper attack helicopters, Soviet Heinz, while Romania has repurposed some of its Puma transport helicopters to also serve in the attack role. Hungarian Heinz have recently been overhauled and returned to service. Still, Romanian Pumas actually have better sensor and weapons capability. Hungary is also equipping part of their small helicopter fleet with some weapons capability. As a side note, Hungary has 20 H-145 helicopters on order, with half of them to receive the weapons package. Its Soviet Mi-8 helicopters are to be replaced by a fleet of more modern Puma variant helicopters. Overall, both sides are in the midst of sweeping modernization efforts. Here's a list of yet unmentioned systems that are yet to be delivered. But let us get back to the front line. Given the proximity to it, the Romanian city of Oradea might be threatened by that one Hungarian frontline brigade, especially the half of it west of the river Krishur. 
In the south, Romanians might try to reach the Hungarian city of Szeged, but as it's a bit far away and mostly behind the river Tisza, which is quite wide, it might prove to be too big of a bite for a single brigade. So taking the bridgehead over river Maros and the town of Mako with it might be preferred instead. But as days and weeks pass, during which both sides would assemble their armies, Hungary would have little choice but to play defensively, faced with twice as many Romanian troops, which are pretty decently equipped. Armored vehicle formations would have a field day on such a flat front line. And when it comes to tanks, Romania is far ahead. Hungary has T-72s and have started receiving first of the 12-strong batch of ex-German army Leopard 2s. The T-72s are fairly basic, roughly several decades old tech level. Romanian tanks are more interesting in the sense that their TR-85 is an indigenous design. Initially inspired by the T-55 layout, then enlarged, it eventually evolved in its later variant into something quite Romanian. Given the sheer numbers, Romanian armor formations would likely be able to dictate any direct tank battles. Hungary would, of course, try to lure the tanks into areas teeming with ATGMs as well, then use their small tank force on a very tiny piece of front to maintain local numerical advantage. But Romanians would avoid headlessly rushing over the whole front. More likely, they would pick a point or two on the border to focus most of their firepower and numbers on. Infantry fighting vehicles would help a little, but neither side uses them in great numbers. Armored personnel carriers are much more common though, but pretty much all are of Cold War era descent, with the possible exception of Romanian upgrade of their IFV, giving it fairly decent optics and spike anti-tank missile capability. As more and more troops populate the front and Romanian numerical advantage becomes obvious, Hungarians would likely retreat from their early winnings picking the few fights they are likely to win, like defending Szeged in the south, but losing quite a bit of territory elsewhere. It's not just the soldier numbers though that would favor Romania. As with armored vehicles, Romania simply has more heavy firepower, and that continues to be evident with artillery as well. Waiting for the German-made Panzerhaubitze 2000, Hungary is without a proper mobile artillery platform. The masses of Todd guns would be brought back from the reserve, but training crews for those would take time. Romanian guns are just as old, but they are at least being used and crews are trained on them. Especially with counting the multiple rocket launchers, uh, Romania simply has many more artillery assets. Anti-tank guided missiles are a mainstay of all modern armies, but their two Hungarians are behind technologically. Today's stocks have dwindled to tiny figures. Romania's recent shopping spree, on the other hand, includes fairly new Israeli systems. As the whole populations rise to arms, the disparity in mobilized populace would become evident. Romania would be mobilizing double the numbers and adding them to low readiness units, likely on par with various paramilitary units. Army reservists might be most useful of the group, especially those that have served in the army in the last decade or so. Luckily for Hungary, such poorly trained and very poorly equipped units would be quite inefficient in offensive operations, probably needing even more than 3 to 1 ratios in numbers to successfully take enemy territory. Morale might also be changing over time, especially if Romanians, due to the nature of offensive operations, like taking urban areas, suffer greater casualties. Nevertheless, the movement of the front line would be inevitable, if slow. Romania would simply be too much for Hungary to handle. Besides twice the population, its economy is weaker, especially in purchasing power parity terms. And Romania has been spending on defense a lot more in the last decade or so, especially the last five years. There is various other details not mentioned, like the fact Romania has decent sized aerial drones, while Hungary does not. Given the very low number of Hungarian combat planes and SAM systems, Hungarian Air Force would eventually find itself whittled down to just several aircraft, while Romanians would still enjoy a few dozen left. So the whole swaths of their country would be subjected to Romanian airstrikes, and perhaps more crucially, air recon, without the ability to counter them. That would be the final nail in the coffin, giving the Romanian troops on the ground ability to push even further. And some further cities would end up surrounded, and possibly forced to surrender. 
it's only the big losses in manpower, bigger than Hungarian ones, as well as the obstacle that is the Tisza River, that might force Romania to decide they are happy enough with their conquests. And the war might eventually stop, with the front line still well away from Budapest. Nevertheless, the final outcome would still be very much unfavorable for Hungary. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.